Hello everybody, I'm Philippa Haynes. And I'm Mark Lee. Welcome to the Accountant Success Secrets Podcast. This is where we showcase and celebrate successful accountants who are doing great things, have years of experience and whose stories can inspire and encourage other accountants around the UK. We talk to accountants who've been running their own practice successfully for a good few years and we ask them to share their story, including the highs, the lows and what they've learned on the way. Our aim is to provide some fundamental insights for you, our loyal listener. If you'd like to share your story in a similar way, do please get in touch with Philippa or myself. So today we are absolutely delighted to introduce Kieran Phelan. Uh, I've said that wrong already. Phelan, is it? Of Sartori yeah. Accounting. Phelan, yes. Perfect. Got it. Thank I, you. Didn't say, I didn't say something. We even <laughs> checked the pronunciation before we started. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. That's cool. We're working oh, with Amy can't win, can you? <laughs> in 2010, Kieran broke the mould by becoming the first zero advisor to, in Northern Ireland and founding the first ever cloud accounting firm in Northern Ireland. Since then, he's been at the forefront of the cloud accounting scheme scene in Northern Ireland. He's also a member of the advisory panel for the Digital Accountancy Show. And in 2019, he was nominated as a top five finalist in the Accounting Excellence Awards as Practice Pioneer of the Year. And his company, Sartori Accounting, was a top three finalist in Zero's annual awards as a 100% Zero firm. And in March 2021, they were awarded Zero's UK Small Firm of the Year. Well done, Kieran. Yeah, Thank you very fantastic. much. Fantastic. Um, so welcome again. And is there anything else you'd like to add to that, which seems like a list of kind of key heroic moments there, Kieran? <laughs> no, I mean, I think I covers the, the, the history of from when we, we started 14 years ago, which feels like four years ago. Yeah. Um, but let, let me tell you, time absolutely flies. Thank you. Well, Philip and I always aim to dig deep into the person behind the accountant. And we seem to manage this with <laughs> notionally five focused questions and still keep the podcast about 30 minutes. Uh, and we'll, we'll take the questions in turn. And, and I start with, and I've realised it's three questions in one, really. Why did you go into accountancy? More importantly, why did you start your own practice? And how did you go about doing that, Kieran? I um, I started in accountancy in 1995. I had finished A-levels at school um, and decided I had offers from universities, but I decided I wanted to try and start a career straight away and start earning money. My mother and father were actually unemployed, so I actually wanted to be earning some money and, and bringing it into the household. Um, and I was deeply in love with my current wife at the time, and we maybe plans to get married young. So I wanted to stay at home as well um, here in Derry. Um, so I did three years in PwC as an accountant technician. Um, I then moved to another firm to do the chartered contract and qualified in 2002. Um, I was then the manager of that firm 2005, 2010, then started my own business. Um, and I think if I reflect back on how did that all come about and why did I end up doing that? I think number one, after only a couple of years in, um, I, I had a feeling I would like to try this myself someday. I mean, I was only 19, 20 when I was thinking like that. So wow. and I always felt like, you know, I'd love to try this myself and you know, set something up, work with clients and stuff like that. Um, so I, st I stuck with it to get all the experience I possibly could. Um, and you get good and bad experience, which is brilliant to take with you. I also remember when I was in PwC, they used to have a department called the MIS department back in the 90s, the Management Information System Department. And they didn't do it at the, in the local office. They ran that out of their Belfast office. But I was always intrigued by because they used to send guys down to go out and train and install software systems for clients and accounting systems and so on. And I always thought that sounds really interesting. So I think I had this notion that that might be something I want to do in the future. I actually did bring that into the practice I went and trained with then and started, we started doing Sage 50 installations and so on. Um, but the pivotal moment came for me after probably watching too many episodes of Dragon's Den and thinking yes. anybody, anybody can run a business. <laughs> and then um, what happened for me was around 2008, I went out to an existing client of that firm and I was horrified they weren't using Sage 50 desktop. They were using something called Accounts 24 seven, which I've never seen again, but, yep. and back then, as, as you could probably imagine, logging on their browser was like, I, I, the guy pulled it up and says, I'm going to log in. And I thought, what on earth is this guy doing? 
Um, and then I realized, uh, hold on, I don't need backups if I can log in from my desk. You know, it was so new at the time, but it just the penny dropped for me that this could be the way forward. And and I like, yeah, I knew um, a software developer um, spoke to me within a month or so, and I happened to mention this, and he said, you should check out a company called Zero from New Zealand. They've started in the UK. I think they're going to be a big thing. Um, checked it out, found that they had a thing called a bank feed, and I thought, this is it. It's the way forward. Nobody else is doing this. So about within a couple of months, I handed me notice and, and said, I'm going to start. And I started with like five clients um, and decided Zero was the way forward. So Yeah, and you haven't looked back haven't looked back since that's amazing isn't it because i mean that really was kind of really at the start of, of cloud accounting no, totally i think i think zero at the time it was i was i was my account manager was darren glanville at the time i think we had four or five employees possibly at the time that i was um starting to get involved with them so it's been a a big journey for everybody ever since then yeah. very much so. I mean, at this stage, I normally ask, you know, sort of what the highs and lows and what have you learned? But but obviously, I mean, you you started, you know, really with a bang, didn't you? Um, and starting new stuff. Yes. So you must have learned quite a lot over the over that journey. Um, yes. What would, what, what would you say kind of stands out? Um. <laughs> I can I can think back to actually when I was actually leaving. And uh, last day I had in my previous firm as an employee, uh, and the partner called me on and said, sit down, I'm going to say a couple of things to you. Um, number one, if you don't get an overdraft. You can't be living in an overdraft. And, you know, because obviously he had experience with all of that. And he also said to me, the day you walk in tomorrow to your new office, close the door, get an A4 page out, and write down how you're getting out of there. Um, I didn't take I didn't take his advice, but a number of years later, you realise that was the best advice that you could give anybody. You know, what is your exit strategy? Because obviously, I think he'd been doing it thirty years plus at that stage, um, and and still found himself, I think, in that sort of situation where you're running the business, you're not totally working on it, you're sometimes in it, and all the frustrations after thirty years have come with that. So. For me, that was a bit of a a, a light bulb moment. They realised, well, actually, he was talking sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that that's been a learning, and I suppose I haven't. I, I really need to focus more on that. And I think I'm now in the latter part of my forties. You start thinking more along those lines. If you haven't already been doing it, you know, time will certainly sharpen your focus on those things. Oh, um, nice. So that that was that's been been one of the learn, learnings. Um, Cloud accounting, I suppose, as well. There's been there's there's been lots to learn in terms of the cloud accounting space. Um, and whilst I did set up a cloud firm in 2010, we probably didn't have full cloud processes until maybe four years later because yeah. the technology wasn't all there at the time. I mean, Receipt Bank Stroke Dex didn't exist in 2010, uh, yeah. so everything was very new. And um, I suppose there's a big education piece for clients even now about cloud and digital and the benefits of that and how to do it so i suppose it's uh, a lot another learning is the the need to have um i suppose it's the simon sinek theory of business being an infinite game it's just it's never going to end until you decide you want it to end it's really never going to end you know um so you just have to keep yourself up to date as much as you can um and tweak and and move forward all the time yeah, and and how, did, how did you foster the relationships that you needed to build up a decent client bank, Kieran? Um, so as I say, I started off with about five clients and I, advert I had no idea about sales and marketing. Um, I mean, absolutely zero experience in that whatsoever. But I had started doing things like if I saw an article somewhere locally or something locally saying a new business has started up, I would lift the phone and ring them and say, look, wouldn't mind having a chatty, you're going to need to do a tax return um, and so on. Um, then I, and that was my sales strategy, I suppose, in the first instance, was just do some local advertising and see where we go and ask for referrals at the start as well. Um, now, some clients who I did work with in my previous firm, after you know six months or so, they did start contacting me, um, which was 
always an awkward sort of situation. Um, and I had agreed with the previous firm, look, I'm not going to take these clients on. I want them to go back to you and have a conversation. But some of them made the decision because I'd worked with them for three or four years that they wanted to make the move. So that, that bring in a number of clients over the first year. But I was totally focused on that not happening and trying to go, what else can I do? So I was trying to do as much networking and stuff as well as I possibly could until social media became more of a thing in business. So it was trying to make connections from then on. Yeah, I mean, just, just to pick up on that, I mean, you know, we've had a conversation. You've, you've also posted on LinkedIn about being an introvert. And, you know, sometimes, you know, those relationships aren't always, they're quite exhausting, aren't they? Um, yeah. How, how did you sort of overcome that what what did what you know with your team and also your clients and also going on social media and you're a public speaker so you're doing all of this stuff How yeah did you do that? I, I would say that for many years I didn't really I can't always know thought I'm, I'm slightly under introverted I I'm an only child um so I could always function solo quite a lot um but never really tagged it as anything other than that. Doesn't see me. I didn't see myself as totally introverted. But at times, I kind of felt like, you know, I do need to have a bit of space by myself. Um, so I suppose not fully realizing it and always pushing myself on. I always kept pushing myself to get in these slightly awkward situations. Um, and whilst it sort of drained me, the more you did it, the, it, you do get better at these things, even though it does feel quite exhausting at the time. Um, but I did get into personal development stuff, I suppose, around 2016 and 17. Um, and it was all to do with trying to create a growth mindset and an empowering mindset. And there was various people that I started, I started watching Tony Robbins on YouTube and other personal development coaches and just subsuming some of that content and thinking, yeah, this could really help me in running my business, in looking after myself and in sort of realizing a number of things as well. Um, but I think I'll, I'll touch on something that happened around that time as well. I had a health problem at that time in my career. Um, and it's a condition called agalasia, which is a swallowing condition. Um, apparently it affects one in 200,000 people. Um, basically your esophagus stops working. So the muscular um, process to swallow food stops working. And a little valve that opens your stomach to drop food in stops working. So I was having problems just swallowing food, but it got progressively worse over about a two year period. But in early 2017, I wasn't able to drink water without regurgitating. It wasn't anything other than just stuff wasn't getting down there. And then I, I had an operation in June 17 um, to rectify that. Um, in the two weeks, I think it was before the operation, I lost, or no, I think it was the four weeks before the operation. I think I lost two, two and a half stone in that period. I was just literally losing weight so fast because nothing was had no nutrition at all. Um, but the operation was successful. It's a condition you just have to manage. You eat food, you swallow loads of water just to wash it down. But that's when I started to think I had already looked at personal development, but I started thinking about I need to completely systemize my business at this stage because this is the thing that made me go down that road. And um, at that point in my career, I had already been talking to James Ashford, who was Gold Proposal at the time. And I'd actually watched videos when James was a business development coach um and they were brilliant a body's but videos and i really started implementing some of the strategies there and I signed up for go proposal which changed a lot as well so yep. um all of those things i think helped me to kind of keep pushing myself forward um as somebody who was still introverted and i got more into coaching other people mentoring other people and doing some speaking as well but i was probably still pushing myself more but i was able to because it empowered my mind a bit more um i would say over the course of the last six to twelve months I am more aware of it now. So if I decide I need to take a bit of time out and just focus on one thing, then I've got a home office, I'll come home, I'll be in my comfort zone and I'll do that for a day. And then I can go back into the office with a couple of new crazy ideas. <laughs> well, uh, that is, it's wonderful. And thank you for sharing all of that, Kieran. It, it's something I only learned uh, a few years ago, the difference between an introvert and somebody who is introverted. Um, yeah, many of us, and whilst my wife would uh, deny it, uh, I know I am introverted. Yeah. However outgoing, exuberant I'm, I might appear. And one of the reasons I know that is because after a day at a Countex or the digital accounting show or something, I don't want to go out partying. I mean, okay, oh, yeah. partly my age, I guess, but there's a limit as to how many conversations I can have 
in yes. a day. It's not that I'm an introvert, I'm introverted. Yes. And, and the other point that I, I just made, because you uh, picked up on, the, the, you referenced the networking earlier, and a lot of accountants are sort of more analytical, technically minded, maybe went into accountancy because they weren't automatically great people per people. They weren't you know, uh, extroverts. You don't need to be to be a great yeah. accountant. Uh, and one of the things I frequently point out when it comes to networking, we have two ears and one mouth. Yeah. Bet the better networkers listen more than they speak. And guess what? That means introverts are better at networking than extroverts. Yeah. Oh, exactly. And, I, and, and just to touch on that as well, because I'm always doing something to help me improve on whatever as a business owner, which I think we all try to do, I started studying about NLP. Yeah. Um, so I became an NLP certified practitioner in July 22. Neuro linguistic programming. For yes, neuro linguistic program. And it's all to do with modeling of the world and also communication techniques. Um, I have to say it's, it's, it's absolutely brilliant in terms of helping you to understand people and have a better relationship with your team, your family, your clients. Yeah. Um, but but like everything, it's like it's not a one hit wonder. You have to practice this as much as you possibly can, you know, on a daily basis. You can't just go to the gym twice and expect to be as fit as as a fiddle, you know. So true. So yeah. true. Totally. Totally. So let's let's um we we've got other stuff we want to talk about, in particular LinkedIn and how that's brought your business. Um, and also how you're now beginning to scale your business. But just before we do that, are there are there any kind of wise wise words or mistakes that you've made um, that you know our listeners should watch out for? I think most most listeners would relate to a mistake around um, maybe team structure and hiring the right people. <laughs> um, it's more difficult, I think, now than, than it ever has been. It's certainly more challenging. Um, there's a bigger lead time in terms of recruitment. So um, if you're if you're thinking you're going to need, you know, to increase your capacity, you probably need to start thinking about it maybe with a six month lead time and have some kind of process for that. Um, so we don't have that at the moment, but I'm aware of it. But it's definitely a mistake I made in the past. I also hired too quickly at times. Can I just pick pick up on that? I don't want to stop the flow, but I think it, it's important because I know it's a question a lot of accountants ask. Yeah. In, in your practice, and I know this, you've got half a dozen, a team of half a dozen, and you outsource workers yeah. well. But it, is it? Do you think it is better to recruit and then backfill with additional work, or to wait till everybody's overworked and try and bring somebody in to relieve the pressure, or? some alternative approach i would say it's better to um create the capacity and then fill the capacity um the challenge that you have as the business owner is you know how do we make sure that we've got enough money to fund that Absolutely. especially when you're a small firm working with smaller business clients um and that brings on your challenges and decisions around your pricing the types of services that you're kind of offering um so and it's it's never perfect it's it's always a work in progress that you're doing these things but i have always and in the past i have definitely gone to a, a situation where you feel like you're at capacity without having all of the data therefore you go now you need to hire and that's always been a challenge because when you bring somebody in you have to bring them introduce them to everybody get them embedded show them the processes start to retrain start to train them or retrain them and that all takes time as well so even when you do hire someone your you know your lead time for having somebody churning out work um it's, it's still ongoing so you're better trying to go you know what i'm going to bring somebody in and get the capacity and then focus on, on growing the business to get that capacity filled brilliant thank you and I think it's so important to to clarify that and get uh, people's different views on it. But what you've just said is pretty constant that I hear from experienced yeah. uh, practitioners. The other mistakes that you've uh, made and what you learned from them? I definitely I hired too quickly, I think, on a, on a couple of occasions. Um, and one of it blew up quite badly for me at, a, a couple of years ago. And it's one of those situations that you, you try to create a certain culture and team environment. and um, all it takes is one thing to go out of kilter to knock the whole thing 
all over the place. You feel like something's not right, but you can't put your finger on it. Um, and I'd, I'd say that I, in the last couple of team members that we hired, it took probably the guts of six months to get the right people. Um, but I have to say the two people that we hired at that point in time, at, at that point in time are absolutely brilliant. So um, be patient as well. So give yourself time to be patient when you're doing that. Brilliant. Yeah. And you've got a, 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 one of your I don't know, more recent recruits, been with you um, three years, uh, designated as the chief operating officer, which yeah. makes you sound as if Satori might, might be bigger than it is. But is this partly because she's doing the stuff that you don't want to do, or or is it a role that she chose for herself or title role? It was it was a role I suppose I created at that point in time to be able to take a, a lot of the operational side of the business in terms of um, making sure the systems and processes were there and being followed through, and especially the quality of the work that we we're doing. So in my firm i was creating a coo to have a very specific set of rules um it might not be the same rule if you're looking at a tech company with a coo but i think you can just design your business whatever way you want to design your business and you know structure it and name it accordingly um i have to say we because we had quite a lot of staff changes over the course of the last couple of years the coo rule probably didn't fulfill what i was trying to get it to fulfill so we had number of staff left the business about four actually within a period of seven months or thereabouts um, and we were down to the bare bones and then having to try to recruit again and we outsourced to sort of fill the gaps and stuff like that so the CEO role didn't it was actually sort of roll your sleeves up and keep going but now I'm at the stage where I think I can see there is the um there is the possibility of okay take on more of the operational side of it and start to look at how the business is actually doing with data and instead of me taking all of that on board all the time and overwhelming myself at the same time. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you in a minute about what makes you and your firm unique. But I just wanted to talk, um, first of all, about you, you said that a couple of your um, recruits didn't work out. And I don't know whether you have values within your business, but I've often um, counseled people to say, if somebody doesn't feel feel right to you have a look at the values and see if there's something that they don't actually tick you know is there something yeah. that they're exhibiting with their behavior that goes against that but anyway um what what i wanted to talk about because obviously your your plan is to build up and to scale and yeah. we talked a little bit earlier about you did a rebrand um and also you know how you do your advertising and your marketing and i think we talked a little bit about linkedin and how that works for you i think that's always a big topic so how does it work for you the linkedin and the advertising generally yeah i mean we we have a pretty steady flow of content that we're churning out through um various social media channels but linkedin's definitely been the one that has generated more interest um now you do get a lot of connections from um people on linkedin which is other people in the industry they want to share knowledge they want to you know see and share information and that's fine you do get a lot of sales stuff coming at you on LinkedIn as well. And um, you just, I think, have to learn to accept that. And you just keep saying no as much as you possibly need to. But in terms of then, um, like, generating leads and so on from LinkedIn, um, I'm just very aware. I'm, I mean, I'm trying to create a CDO role in our business at the moment, which is a chief development officer, to kind of get more involved with this from a data point of view. But it's very much like you're creating content. Are you just going to let it sit there? Or are you going to try and see what the what's happening with that so i try as much as i can to see what engagement there is and always try and reply and have conversations and you know make comments um, and people who are making a comment you're replying and just have a look and see who is replying and see if you can actually create some leads on a list even from from people who are engaging you know who are they what's their business where are they at put them on a list and maybe then go back to them um, at some point and say, look, can we put you on our email list? I know you've been watching some of our content and just kind of drag things forward from there. It's a longer lead time, Philippa, um, in relation to social media. So you have yeah. to be expecting that as well. But like everything, you'll get out whatever you're putting into it. So there's times I've been too busy doing other things and you're not getting any you know, leads coming through or as many calls in the diary. But the times that you do ramp it up a bit, it definitely does have a return. Massively important. Okay. 
very, very much so. And I, I echo all that, in particular, the long lead time. And yeah. Yeah, is it the right people who are engaging with your content? And is, frankly, posting content, loads of content, uh, you say you, know, you get out what you put in. Um, I think there's been a lot of hype around social media and LinkedIn too. Yeah. Uh, that means there's a lot of accountants, I would say wasting time, but spending a lot of time doing stuff on LinkedIn that they could get a better return faster by doing yeah. different things on LinkedIn rather than copying what everybody else seems to be doing without necessarily yeah. getting results they want. And especially a lot of the advice is copying stuff that works for marketing and PR people and yeah. coaches, but doesn't necessarily, when you really dig down, doesn't seem to be working uh, for accountants. But I'm not going to get into a LinkedIn webinar. Uh, I've got one of those coming up on the 22nd of February in the morning. Anybody who's interested, links uh, on my uh, on LinkedIn somewhere. Um, yeah. There's a really important point in that as well. If I could just jump on there, Mark. Um, yeah. A lot of the people we see being successful on social media. Number one, it is only what it is. It, you're only seeing tops of icebergs. We we I think we're all aware of that. Absolutely. But the truth the truth of the matter is that there really is. There's only one version of you. And therefore, you are running your business, no matter what it is, accountants, whatever. Um, yep. You're running your business. You have your goals. You have your strategy for your business. And you have to be you when you're on social media. 100%. Um, and that's important, I think, nowadays when we're talking about AI. I mean, it's, uh, last week, I get two messages within 30 seconds of each other from two completely different people. But it was the exact same AI-generated message, direct message. It was sales outreach. Exact same two different industries using probably chat, GBT, and it, I think it was just pure coincidence, but it was literally within 30 seconds of each other, I got the same message. So you have to be yourself and be human in order to connect with humans. People are um, people are not silly. They'll spot something that's just regenerated or you know AI-based stuff. It's, it's easily spottable. Yeah. So is that your superpower then? Because I'm meant to be asking about what mm -hmm. makes your firm unique. So before we kind of move on what what would you say i, I mean we we've we got we just mentioned about core values um follow up and we we do have core values um it is empathy human um remarkable um be curious um and there's two others so being empathy human is one of them care curious human yeah remarkable. well yeah. done Mark. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> it's a, it's a great website. It's very easy to find stuff on it. <laughs> very good. Um, and funny thing about values as well is that in times when I had challenges with staff, they didn't tick all of those boxes, but just putting them up on the wall doesn't mean that people are going to buy into them. So that's another lesson to, to learn. You know, you have to actually live and breathe that. Um, and that's something I've got better at in the last couple of years. Um, and only recently, actually, I'd done some reviews with, with the team. Um, and one of the team members, I actually said, look, just to be completely honest, I don't think you're as empathetic as you, you could be. So you need to work on that and you need to stop doing this and you need to try thinking about things like that. But they were actually, good thing was, they were aware of it already. They kind of, they were younger and I think there's, you know, experience needs to be brought to the situation. Um, so, I th and I think in terms of a superpower, I suppose, in terms of working with customers and so on, we, I've, I've told the team this year, I want you to ring people more than you email them. Um, we're all guilty of funny phone calls more than emails. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I try to get people to to be more human along those lines as well. Um, yeah. And that's what that's what our existing clients. We have a, we have an average lifetime client value of about six years at the moment, um, which is which is not too bad. I'm trying to push that up ways, but people stay with us because we do contact them and deal with them more. Nice. But your you've, you've, your average client is bigger than many smaller, comparable and smaller firms, I I think. Uh, so I would yeah. imagine that the clients that are leaving you after a few years uh, are probably the smaller ones or the bigger ones that sell up uh, and move yeah. up. Anybody who's left us, I can put my hand in my heart and say, over the years, um, they've only left because A, they decided to close their business down um or b they left because of price yeah and both of those are perfectly acceptable yeah, yeah. 
Well, great stuff. As always, we could talk for ages because uh, I think we've just scratched the surface. But, um, you know, obviously, uh, we appreciate your time um, that you've given to us. Um, no and we would love for you to kind of tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you, the best way of getting in touch with you and your team uh, so they can find you. Yeah, I mean, jump onto our website. You'll get all our profiles on there. You'll get email addresses. Um, my email address is Kieran, K-I-E-R-A-N, at satoriaccounting.com, but it's, it's on our website as well. So, Or drop me a message through LinkedIn. You'll get me on LinkedIn. Great. Brilliant. Thank you. And, Philippa, how can listeners find out more about you and Insight 101? So, yeah, I'm on LinkedIn too, or you can, get, you can go on my website, uh, insight101.co.uk, um, and I'll actually be talking about marketing and the myths and the do's and don'ts on the 21st of March for the ICB. So that's when I'll next be doing a little bit of a turn. And Mark, finally, tell us, um, you mentioned your webinar, but how can people get in touch with you in, in the yeah, meantime? Well, online everywhere, I'm Bookmark Lee. Uh, so that's my LinkedIn profile, Mark Lee, FCA, to distinguish me from the other 5,000 Mark Lees on LinkedIn. Uh, my website <laughs> is bookmarkly.co.uk and within the next week there will be a brand new website up there uh, on LinkedIn I publish uh, regular articles and the latest one uh, does have a link to book for uh, the webinar on the morning of the 22nd of February uh, how accountants and bookkeepers can really master LinkedIn rather than just listen to all the hype and misconceptions that uh, so many people seem to get disappointed by. Brilliant. Okay, well, thank you for that, Mark. Uh, thanks for Kieran. If you've enjoyed the Accountant Success Secrets podcast, please share the love online, uh, leave a review uh, on Apple or Spotify, and let us have your feedback. Absolutely, too. And do please reach out to, again, as I say, to either Philippa or myself if you'd like to be interviewed on a future podcast. Thanks again to Kieran so much for sharing your insights and advice there and to Philippa for organising everything and uh, for your valuable contributions too. Until next time on the Accountant Success Secrets podcast or anywhere else we might meet online or in real life. Bye for now. Bye for now. Bye.